Cool, so good morning, my name is Deepak and I'm a uh, research fellow with the Synthetic Biology Center. And so today we're just gonna talk about kind of how do we apply synthetic biology for augmentation in the capacity of talking about organoids. And so where I first wanna start is about 25 years ago, we saw actually an ear on the back of a mouse from Linda Griffith here at MIT and some other researchers in the Boston area. And you start thinking to yourself, well, wow, we're building tissues. But in actuality, it's just some polymer on the back of a mouse that you've squirted some cells on, and so you've grown a structure. Fast forward 30 years, we can say, well, I can 3D print that same structure now in an hour, which used to take five years to make, just because you had to make the polymers, you had to understand how to implant them. But really, all we've done is build a structure. That structure is just a great thing to put some earrings on, but in reality, it's not <laughs> functional. By no means is this actually going to be a functional ear by any means. So we have to start thinking about how do we actually grow and augment tissues in a way that actually gets past this structural specification and actually incorporates function. And the tools of synthetic biology is actually something we can do. We have some proteins and genes. These proteins and genes come together in biochemical reactions to form interactions. Those interactions then become pathways that can now encode sensing processing actuation and in turn leads to a cell. Groups of cells become tissues and cultures. And all of a sudden we can start thinking about how do we actually engineer underlying elements to create functional novel behavior? So this is always a good time to pause and reflect that a cell, robots, biobots, whatever you want to call them, often benefit from establishing kind of engineering paradigms so we can think about this a little bit more deeply. If we had to engineer a cell from scratch, we probably wouldn't put the mitochondria and the ribosomes exactly where they are. But we can use kind of this sensing processing actuation and start brainstorming the fact that there are many modalities accessible to us in this programming nature. I can go at the chemical molecule, I can use proteins, I can use mRNA, I can use all of them all together. And we can actually put all of these together to start thinking about how do we build systems. This is where I usually take a pause and say, while we often think about digital logic and this very ordered cell, courtesy of Tim Liu, where we can program anything, uh, it's always healthy to know, as we are before lunch, that a cell is closer to a burrito. So we have to start thinking, how do we harness biology? How do we augment these things? And how do we actually get to a place where we can build systems using biology? So let's take a case of I wanted to grow a new liver. A program that you might think about is if I have a single stem cell, I'm going to write a genetic program that has it actually multiply. So now I have a collection of iPSC cells. I have to go through some symmetry breaking operation that yields now these prototypical cell types that can become this actual potential liver. So rather than just putting some polymers down and squirting cells on it, can I get through the symmetry breaking to make the hepatocytes, the vasculature, their actual neuronal tissues, and in turn grow into these organoids on a chip or actually true functioning organs? And that's actually where we are today, is how do we go through this process of writing genetic programs for augmented organoids as well as future organs that don't even exist right now? Why is it that our livers can't see in the dark? Maybe they should have rods and cones as well. So that's where we are. And so now for the next kind of few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are in this process and what kind of we can do so far. So over the last 30 years, there's been immense research efforts in iPSCs and all sorts of consideration. But one of the things we realized is cells actually go through a cell fate kind of decision tree that can be manipulated in many ways. Originally, we discovered uh, that using small molecules or the Yamanaka factors, you could take cells both forwards and backwards through the decision tree of differentiation. And so one of the things we would want to do then is how do we make this autonomous? How do we make it so that way we can grow new organs using these synthetic networks? So that might look like this, where we have just some iPSCs. iPSCs then can become either ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm. So again, going down this hierarchy of differentiation that is actually recapitulating uh, just embryogenesis here. From there, certain cell types will actually differentiate into kind of the specialized lungs, livers, stomachs, and you just keep going down and down where you have all of these 
cell types that you need to navigate a cell down these fates and avoiding going down the other fates using a genetic program. This seems very simple because it just looks like it's a binary decision tree. In reality, it is actually not as nuanced as that. But you can still, we try to write this program saying we want a self-timed differentiation uh, multi-step process where I have an input chemical that starts down this progression and I incorporate feedback. And indeed, that's what we've been starting to do is this is now work that was published a few years ago. Patrick Gee and Mo uh, Ibrahim, both of whom are familiar in the MIT community as we've all been here 10 years now. Uh, but these endoderm then start expressing these self-fate regulators and you actually go through the symmetry breaking where you can have um, a fairly simple circuit integrated into these iPSCs that in the presence of a small molecule docs that is FDA approved, you can now start having the first symmetry breaking happen where during day zero to five you would have this break, you remove that input and the actual circuit will continue operating, hopefully getting into that first symmetry break. So here's some experiments that we actually did where we introduce a mixed cell population. They're all iPSCs to start, but one is fated to become actually this endoderm and the other is actually going to become ectoderm. So the endoderm is these blue cells um, and the red cells are this ectoderm. After administering docs, you'll see that those blue cells start turning green, showing that they've actually gone through that first cell uh, differentiation. We can go a little bit further and after that critical symmetry break, eventually we can actually start staining for downstream things. So that mesoderm is actually going to become the vasculature and we can start staining for blood vessels in these prototypical tissues. We can take that endoderm and they actually become hepatocytes, starting to make uh, albumin and fibronectin that we can see expression of, showing that it is truly a, a hepatocyte. And in turn, we can actually make all sorts of different cell types already. So just in this very simple circuit, we've been able to make the three main classes, mesoderm, endoderm, ectoderm, and through actually very, uh, various kind of coaxing downstream of that, we've now generated around 15 different cell types. And now the hard part is, is we don't know how to build a liver, like truly, but we know that all the cells in the liver we can map, and they are all of these cells that we've been able to make. So we're now in this kind of feedback cycle of how do we engineer new programs to get the cells where we want to. Because indeed, it is these very local rules that govern this global structural specification, and that's where we truly are. So with that, we've been working on a lot of things. Here's like an organoid that I made yesterday, and it is just 50,000 cells with different circuits. This one is going to try to have differential adhesion, so that we, we have like a sticky inner core and an outer core, and that's uh, kind of like where we are. We live in the future. They are kind of ugly at times. Here's a huge organoid that I made uh, a month ago. And they're actually like as big as your fists if you actually put them all together, which is kind of cool to think about. Is right now, it's not that unlike if I just stretched it over a cartilage scaffold, I can put it on my hand and say I have an ear. So with that, all this work takes many, many people as this is probably around 10 years of work, both by myself, by all of my collaborators, by the entire Weiss Lab as a whole. And I'm always happy to chat about anything related to ears, burritos, and Synbio. <laughs>